Hey everyone, this is Daniel and in today's video I want to talk about all the fun and new exciting announcements that were made at Ignite 2021 about the Power Platform. In fact, I was so excited that I didn't even shave. I said I have got to record this and share with all the Power Addicts all the new features that were announced. But first, here's my intro video. So today is March 2nd and there was a ton of new exciting features that were announced and I've put that all together, so let's jump into it. Now, the first thing I'm gonna do is talk about Power Apps and then Power Automate and so on and so forth. Now, the first thing about Power Apps, which was really exciting for me, was the introduction of Power FX. And Power FX is now a local programming language for everyone. So when it talked about Power FX, the, the FX, the first thing that they explained about was it is literally built for no code because that's always been the foundation of the Power Apps canvas, basically the entire Power Platform. But in addition, Power FX is actually based on a Microsoft Excel-ish type of format when it comes to formulas and things like that. In fact, as you can see in the documentation over there, it is allowed so that existing users will already be familiar with it, specifically business users, but then power uh, or professional developers will be able to go ahead and kind of take that and express more logic and solve more problems over there. Finally, it is open source, which is huge, because now they'll be able to uh, allow us by default from the get-go to share those resources so that you can actually go ahead and start working on it. Now, they were very clear about this, that this is going to be an ongoing process. It's not going to be, bam, immediately come out and everybody has to start using it. They're going to slowly start deploying it, and the exact timeline is still to be determined. Uh, but don't get too concerned about this, saying that, oh, man, I got to go ahead and figure out to learn another coding. No, that's not the case. Um, what you're familiar with right now will be easily to adopt or just work with. Um, either way, it's not going to happen immediately, so don't get concerned about it, but definitely keep an eye on that over there. Now, more information about this was already said because when they were talking about this and explaining it, uh, they're leaning more towards the concept of using formulas as against just expressions. And here was the definition of that. It said it makes it easier to define a calculation with the formula. Um, that why, that's why it's able to specifically target it and automatically get updated over there. In addition, it definitely helps to save source of, tr uh, it saves uh, time. It's also able to save money as far as reducing the errors and the time kind of calculates that into money over there. So kind of keep an eye on that. Again, the whole concept of Power FX is new, and they've also come up with these timelines. So by the end of 2021, uh, it is going to be available for the Dataverse calculated columns as well. In addition, uh, they will also start deploying that to, in the AI builder data prep section over there. So wherever AI is being leveraged, you will start seeing Power FX formulas being applied over there or available over there. And then finally, in the Power Virtual Agents, that's kind of on the bottom of the list over there. Again, the key key thing I want you to know is do not be concerned about this. It is going to come out slowly and it's going to come out over a longer period of time. Uh, but start getting yourself familiar with this. All right. Here is the final thing is when I said it is going to be you know, shared by the community over here. When you say community, you know what it means. Directly GitHub. So over here, if you see the link below, uh, they've already gone ahead and put some information over there, given some example of the docs to use expressions and grammars and things like that. So kind of go and take a look at that. Um, and so you can at least start seeing what it is about and what you should expect over there. So that's the whole concept of uh, Power uh, uh, Power Apps and Power FX over there. All right, so let's go and switch gears now into Power Automate. Now, in Power Automate, there was a big announcement that was made. And the whole announcement was on the concept of by default in your Windows 10 OS over there, they will already have the flexibility to have RPA functionality available. What that basically means is that all Windows 10 users can harness the power of low code uh, using the RPA. But now, ever since uh, from the March 2nd onwards, it will be included in your Windows 7. Uh, therefore, it will already start coming out in the new preview, so you'll kind of start seeing it over there. But moving forward, you won't have to actually download it. It will already be available over there. And this is, again, the same thing. There's no um, you know, new stuff as far as the RPA goes. Well, there's a lot of little things here and there that they fixed, but the overall big information is that it will already be available um, for your uh, low-code RPA system, and then you don't have to download it. It'll come directly with your Windows 7 over there, and it'll come with no additional cost. That's the key thing, no additional cost over there. So all in all for the RPA system over there, pretty much in the Windows automated desktop, um, it is still the automated tasks with uh, which we, which you can do to automate it with ease using the RPA system over there. Huge productivity boosting over there because none of the mundane tasks that you do again and again 
they automatically do come um, you can go ahead and you know record those uh, it is easy to get started because it's very simple no code process it's all a, in a clicking process over there and then finally as i mentioned over there it is going to be available to windows 10 users it will actually come with the next build over there at no additional cost keep that in mind all right so let's go and switch gears now over to power bi the big big announcement in power bi over here was the whole concept of preview for gen 2. If you hear Gen 2 and you hear Power BI, immediately think of premium per user license over there, which will be generally available. So what does that mean? The whole concept of premium uh, per user license gives you the flexibility um, to go ahead and start consuming capacity and allocating capacity down to the per user basis over there. In addition, it gives you faster processing, 16 times performance boost. That's, that's kind of huge. And that it also gives you the consistency and reliability to have cost management with utilization metrics. All these new features are coming over there. But I know, I know you're more concerned about the licensing piece. So let's kind of talk about that a little bit. See, after this whole concept has been in preview for over three months now, they are announcing the whole Power BI uh, premium per use. Now, what that per use means is that if you have an existing Power um, Apps Pro, uh, Power BI Pro user, then you just have to do an added price of ten dollars per user per month over there. It's just an addition to that. Uh, otherwise, the starting power price per user per month is going to be $20 over there. All right, so the net difference is $10. But the key key thing about the per user per premium um, is those really, really, you know, power users that you have are constantly building all these reports and sharing it with the community or on your company over there. For them, sometimes the Power BI Pro is not enough from a capacity management, from a performance management. So you, instead of going ahead and buying a full premium, you can actually just go and buy a premium per user. So that user will get dedicated more capacity and then also the work that he or she is doing to build those reports directly benefit the rest of the company over there. So that's the whole concept of the, uh, the Power BI premium per user which was announced over there. All right, so let's go and switch gears and now talk about Power Virtual Agents because there was quite a few announcements that were made over there. One of the first thing is the topic overlap detection, and this is huge. I mean, you've seen my videos in Power Virtual Agents, and you see how I go ahead and build topics and everything. Right now, there is no one way to go ahead and say that, hey man, that topic that you made over here, a whole bunch of it actually already exists over there. So the topic overlap detection was just not available. That required me to figure all of that out and then see, okay man, am I dupl duplicating these topics or whatnot? very soon that's going to be available it'll actually come and say that hey there is an overlap of by so much percent in the basis of these two topics over there so that's kind of really huge and i personally am very excited about that um, in addition it's going to start making suggestions which means the ai is going to uh, kick in over there and saying suggestions from uh, from transcripts to address graphs so it's kind of the opposite of the topic suggestion because in topic suggestions it tells you that hey these topics are kind of overlapping in this one, it is saying based on the transcripts and all the AI work that's been put in over there, it's telling you that there's actually gaps in the topics, which means if somebody is asking you a question, it doesn't have enough triggers or there aren't enough topics which are covering them. So there's this gap. So that again gives you all the information that you need to go ahead and fill those gaps so that a chatbot will be really user friendly over there. And this is basically just an overview is that it's the thanks to the new AI capability that all these new features such as even addressing questions and everything kind of comes up into that. In addition, um, it is helping you to go ahead and make it more uh, user friendly and reusable. So basically, if you've gone ahead and asked a certain number of questions to the user, simple things like give me your email address, zip code, so on and so forth, it is already going to store that information from you. So it'll be reuse it. And reusable means it's not going to prompt the user the same answers again and again. So again, this whole con uh, the whole concept of making it reusable at the same time reusing other information from Microsoft Graph using obviously the Azure AD authentication over there makes it more user centric, more user friendly over there. So those were the big ones on the Power Virtual Agents. Now, as you know, anything that has to do with new features has to do with Microsoft Teams, and they actually made a really great announcement over there, which I personally liked, and this was the key one for me. We know that there is a huge I mean, connection between the Power uh, uh, Platform and Teams. They basically so blend in well so much these days, but they've gone ahead and taken that to the next level. Initially, there was a limit of only 500 environments that could be created uh, in, Power, uh, in, the, in the Power Platform when they were generated from Teams. Well, they've gone ahead and raised that limit to 10,000. Now, I want to keep in mind that that only is the total number of teams that can be generated. So this doesn't increase that limit of the 2 gig per environment. That, that 2 gig limit is still there. 
but increasing the limit of 500 to 10,000, that's huge because we know that there were some enterprise companies where 500 wasn't enough for them. But 10,000, that's definitely gonna help a lot of people, especially put a lot of smile on, on the enterprise people's faces over there. All right, so let's now go ahead and talk, switch gears and talk about the security and governance across the entire Power Platform. And they had a lot to share about that. I mean, if you guys know me, uh, I'm one of the people who say security first, performance later. All these announcements they made, that was a huge smile on my face. And I just couldn't stop smiling when they talked about all these things. So let's quickly take a few uh, information about a few of these. Um, tenant isolation is going to be huge because now admins can actually configure the tenants uh, so we can isolate that to different power platform sections over there, including connections to the tenants from their external tenants. So they're going to go ahead and use in the whole concept of ADD based connectors to go ahead and make sure which of them can be blocked, which cannot be blocked. Uh, maybe you don't want your, um, certain connectors from your tenant be kind of talking to the other uh, tenants, so on and so forth. Tenant isolation is huge. In fact, there were some scenarios where I had to put in a ticket to stop that, but now, now they're going to go ahead and bring that directly into the admin center. So that's huge. Next is the endpoint filtering for connectors. When you think about endpoint filtering over there, it's basically the whole concept of giving the admins um, the filtering on where the data source really is. It's not at the app level, it's right down to the data source level. And a great example they shared at the Ignite over there was the concept of, hey, I wanna connect to SQL, but I wanna connect it down to this instance of SQL, right down to that granular level connection over there. And that really helps, right? Because as it says over there, it can definitely block some risky endpoints. So when you just do it at SQL, before it could be connecting to any of the SQLs over there, but now, right now you're making it more granular uh, so that you're exposing you know, any sensitive data, you can make it granular over there. So it's really helpful for the endpoints uh, filtering for connectors over there. Next is the whole concept of connection action control. So what does that mean? Uh, Twitter is a great example over here because what they wanted to do was they say you had Twitter as a connector um, in an environment over there, and you had other things, other environment, other connectors over there. Like you had SharePoint and so on and so forth. They just wanted to make sure that you didn't actually take data from an existing place and post it on Twitter, which means that they didn't want you to have post act access to, you know, to write stuff to Twitter. The only level they wanted you to do is actually go get data from Twitter. And that granular level uh, security is the new thing which they're talking about is the connection action control. And again, at Ignite, they did a sweet demo where they were able to actually go ahead and click on that connector over there. There's an option on the top called configuration connectors and then configuration connectors. As you can see in that screenshot over here, um, you can tell that, hey, I'm gonna allow Twitter connector to be part of this en um, environment over here, but it's only gonna get information right down to that connection uh, granular level at the connector level. This is pretty sweet over here. And the example used Twitter over here, but this will be apl applicable for quite a few other connectors as well. All right, email filtration controls this is huge. And that's actually one of the concerns that even I had, but they've gone ahead and taken care of that. Key, key things about stuff like this is that now with your Office 365 mail connector, you will have access to make sure that there is no emails that are distributed outside your tenant without the admin's approval or oversight. That's one of the key things that this will do. Something right now which you cannot be blocked over there unless you've taken care of it from your network side or, or other things. This is now directly a feature that will be added in over there. So you can go ahead and take care of that. All right, so there were some other announcements which we are not really familiar with, but they were still important. The whole concept of Azure networking connectivity. Uh, and in the session when, they, when uh, Charles Namana talked about this, I was not really understanding what had happened. But then they had a break a breakout session over there where all the PMs basically joined on the call and I went ahead and signed up for that. And they actually did a really good job um, answering that. So thank you for the product group over there. Uh, one of the things on the Azure network connectivity is basically the whole concept of le uh, allowing Microsoft's virtual network. So Microsoft's virtual network is, as it says, virtual network when you're going ahead and using all the Microsoft Azure services, directly having their resources over there, VMs and so on and so forth. Um, Previously, even for those type of machines on the Azure networking, you would still have to install a gateway to talk to those machines. Well, now you don't have to do that. What you will be able to do is go ahead and create a private endpoint, and then thanks to that, you'll be directly able to go ahead and talk to those machines without the need of any gateways or any other extra work because it's already using the Azure networking connectivity. So this is down the road, but it's something just to keep in mind on. Also, another interesting thing is to use customer managed keys. 
Now, you and I know that when we have to make a secure connection to a service or a data, you use that using keys, right? Um, and many a times we don't have to worry about this because Azure already, or Microsoft already takes care of that when you go ahead and make these uh, keys over there. But in some scenarios for some customers, they do need to have the customer provide the key for whatever reason, higher security level or certain key provide, uh, services that they use over there. And this functionality was not available. Well, now they're going to go ahead and provide that. And again, using the combination of Azure over here and the flexibility to use, I mean, using the combination of Azure services and the flexibility of leveraging that in the Power Platform, this is another service that will come out later this year. So it was announced and I'm looking forward to that. All right, this is huge. You can now, or later this year, start using the Microsoft Information Protection Support inside Power Platform, which is, think about it, huge. I mean, the whole concept, when I say information protection, the first thing that should come to your mind is labels. And the security labels can be tied down inside Power Platform. And you can see in the screenshot over here, they are using this label such as high sensitivity or general or business. Labels that you've created can be used inside Power Platform. And the use of connectors is one example. Like anybody who has this type of label assigned should, or you can assign a label into the, uh, right down to a connector over here. So this is neat because we are already familiar with it, how it works on the Microsoft 365 side, using it on different things such as even Word, documents, PowerPoint, so on and so forth. The same concept can be applied over here in the Power Platform as well. So the concept is not new, but bringing that over here is just helping strengthen the security piece over there. Now, more and more functionality is also provided in the governance control, specifically on the analytics piece over here. So I like that they have now provided more tenant-wide analytics. And as you can see the screenshot over here, uh, it provides more information about you know, unique users that have come in. How many times did the new users actually use stuff? More and more analytics out of the box, which is provided over there, directly in your Power Platform Admin Center or PPAC that they call it over there. And here's another example. Again, the tenant-wide and analytics in the usage section, you can see those unique users. You can go ahead and see how many times the new users actually used. More and more information has been provided on that side. So basically at the end, Charles Lamana did end with these five focus areas that they have for the next level of low code, enterprise trust, trust, which means if you are using it at an enterprise level, you should have the tools and resources for enterprise to go ahead and trust those apps over there. AI everywhere, and we've gone ahead and seen so many places where AI is gonna be leveraged, examples that we've seen over there, more and more places AI will be leveraged, including things such as Power Virtual Agents. The whole concept of remote work was now pretty much part of our lives, and they want to make sure that anytime any things come out, it will take care of uh, the flexibility of remote work over there. Fusioning of teams. Now, I mean, when you hear teams, it's not the capital T. It's the concept of low code versus developers, going ahead and making them work together to actually get all that information. And then hyper automation, going ahead and speeding up the process, automating it, those were all part of the actual five focuses. I really like how he went and ended that session because this is huge. I like that they have a goal in mind and every other new releases that are coming out needs to have all of these options selected over there. Now, I cannot end this video by, before talking about the Microsoft Mesh. I mean, when they talked about that at the keynote, I was, wow. I mean, the whole concept of Microsoft Mesh, and I love the way that they summarized it into these three different things. It's like, you need to feel the presence you need to experience together and you need to connect from anywhere. I mean, those demos and even some of those interesting, you know, demos that they show the concept of Microsoft Mesh. I mean, the whole concept of, you know, feel the presence. I mean, the demos that they did was fantastic. Even you have, you know, you can go to their websites and see some of these videos over here that when you're working with someone, besides the fact that you see their faces, now using the HoloLens over there, you can actually engage, have eye contact over there, see the gestures. You literally will feel the presence. In addition, it gives you the functionality to have that experience together mode. So besides the fact that you know you are there, but you can also go and see the other person, you can go and collaborate together on you know, HoloLens 3D type modeling over there. It really helps to make decision making so much more easier and it also helps to make speed up processes because together you can see something, you can experience it together as against you forwarding you know, spreadsheets or PowerPoint presentations and whatnot, Word documents, collaborate together virtually. And the option to connect together is already available over there. You can do it through HoloLens, you can do it through other VR headsets over there, phones, mobile apps over there, and you can also do it through your PCs or tablets. All of that was available. In fact, I like the way this one text was made is that you can actually feel like you're in the same place and Microsoft Mesh power shared experiences in the mixed reality OEM. So all this I shared was just on account of day one. 
and there's still two more days left over there. So I highly urge you to go and enjoy watching all of those sessions, learn, start planning how you're gonna apply them in the future, and as always, keep using Power Platform.